Good morning, everyone. The oversight hearing by the Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony concerning ocean and wildlife conservation priorities for the new administration and the 111th Congress. Under Committee Rule 4G, the Chairwoman and the Ranking Minority Member will make opening statements. We begin the 111th Congress during a period of great uncertainty for our nation. The United States faces an economic crisis that has led to the loss of more than three million jobs, frozen credit markets, and resulted in large federal and state budget deficits. Ever-increasing energy demands are driving efforts to rapidly develop new and existing energy sources, while the threat of climate change has potential has great potential to affect virtually every aspect of our society. These realities are presenting new challenges to how we manage and conserve our natural resources. Spending freezes and budget cuts in many states and the territories have led to a reduction in and the cancellation of conservation projects for fish and wildlife habitat restoration. Charitable giving from private endowments and foundations and corporations has also declined. Further straining the capabilities of public-private conservation partnerships dependent on non-federal sources of funding. In addition to this, the push for new energy development and energy conservation has created unanticipated trade-offs for conventional fish and wildlife conservation. Wind energy is just one example. As we seek to develop green wind farms, we still have little understanding of how wind turbines installed on an industrial seal might impact migratory bird populations that the federal government invests millions of dollars annually to conserve. At the same time, climate change is causing shifts in migration and habitats of many species that we are only just beginning to understand. The dynamic nature of this period of time directly challenges our conventional approaches to the conservation of fish and wildlife habitat and to the maintenance of healthy ecosystems. In fact, the dynamic nature of our time suggests the need for a new conservation paradigm and new information and management tools to effectively conserve fish and wildlife habitat over the long term and across an uncertain landscape in the 21st century. We need specific, practical, and constructive recommendations and priorities if we are to develop a new framework to support science-based and information-driven adaptive management of our fish and wildlife resources, both on land and in the ocean. So I look forward to hearing from our invited witnesses who are presently engaged in a variety of innovative approaches to address these needs. And I also look forward to engaging my colleagues in a broader dialogue to determine how we might shape a more effective, adaptive, and cooperative conservation model for the time that we live in. And now as chairwoman, I recognize Mr. Hastings, the ranking Republican member of the Natural Resources Committee for any statement that he may have. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. And uh, I, am, I have to say that I am here in place of the ranking member of this subcommittee, Henry Brown, who is uh, delayed because of, uh, of the weather. And so I will just simply ask unanimous consent that Mr. Brown's uh, full statement uh, appear in the record and we'll go to the panel. Hearing no, hearing no objection, so ordered. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I would also like to uh, I'd like to recognize uh, other members who are here with us. Uh, uh, Lois Capps from the state of California. Uh, Donna Christensen from the Virgin Islands. And Mr. Cradiville, Mr. Cradiville. I welcome you to our subcommittee meeting today. Um, and I thank Mr. Hastings and I would now like to recognize our first panel of witnesses who are already seated. Mr. Jeff Trandall, Executive Director of the National Fish and Wildlife Federation. Dr. Peter Kariva, Chief Scientist and Director of Science, the, Na the Nature Conservancy. 
Mr. Barton Thompson, Jr. Mr. Thompson is the Perry L. McCarty Director of the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Robert E. Paradise Professor of Natural Resources Law at Stanford University. And finally, Mr. John Boffman, member of the Sporting Conservation Council. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to our hearing. I will begin now with um, the first of the uh, panel. And as we begin, I would note for all the witnesses that the red timing light on the table will indicate when five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. We would appreciate your cooperation in complying with these limits and be assured that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. And now, Mr. Trandall, thank you for joining us today, and please begin. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Mr. Hastings, and uh, members of the committee, um, I'm Jeff Trandall, the Executive Director of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and I have to first start by apologizing. Uh, Mark Rockefeller, the chair of our board, uh, was delayed because of the storm in New York and not able to appear, so I'm appearing in his behalf. I'll summarize uh, some of his statement and be available, obviously, at the end for questions or at the end of the panel for questions. Um, as we uh, approach this year, the foundation was created 25 years ago, and it was created specifically to generate private dollars to match with federal seed monies on conservation projects of mutual interest between the federal government and the private sector. In its history, we've managed more than $500 million of grant dollars and has leveraged an impact of over $1.5 billion on the ground. Excuse me, could you move just a little closer to the mic, please? Thanks. Bring it closer. There you go. Thank you. Um, in its history, it's managed more than $500 million and has leveraged, uh, leveraged a total impact of $1.5 billion. The source of these leverage funds have come from corporate, individual, state, and other non-federal sources. As we all know, these have been especially difficult and challenging times. While the last few years have provided a very positive trend related to increased environmental awareness and giving, the entire landscape has changed in the last six months. Nationally, philanthropic giving has taken a sudden dip and environmental giving is expected to lose resources as funders begin to respond to human need programs such as shelters and food banks. With this in unanticipated and rapid decline in the economy and also major changes in the political environment, I believe the way to increase conservation funding from private sources, corporate and individual, is to do two things in particular. One, provide clear prioritization of federal goals and objectives, and two, create incentives to maintain and increase environmental giving by promoting the partner of private and federal resources around common goals. First, I need to say that I believe strongly that there are many immediate and high priority conservation needs. And more importantly, I strongly believe there is a significant, significant financial giving capacity that can still be harnessed from the corporate community and other philanthropic funders if the right actions are taken even in this difficult economy. As the subcommittee knows well, the federal government continues to be the largest funder of conservation work throughout the United States. Congress and the federal government oversees much of that funding directly, and other funds are distributed to state and fish and wildlife agencies through federal programs such as Pittman Robertson. The federal dollars are divided among several different agencies and co cover hundreds, if not thousands, of different priorities. This investment has significant public benefits and positive impacts on land, sea, and air. That said, federal agency expenditures on conservation are also so broad and diverse, it is incredibly difficult to comprehend exactly what the federal government's overall goal is for such spending. What are the federal conservation priorities? For example, many federal statutes require agencies to treat all, equal, all issues equally rather than encouraging agencies around conservation partners to prioritize their efforts around achieving achievable conservation outcomes. More, moreover, across federal agencies, even within, within individual agencies, there are differing conservation goals and objectives. For private funders, these competing priorities cause confusion and sometimes lead to inaction. Major private funders in conservation tend to be focused on many of the same funding priorities as the federal government. How often, however, often the programs are not operated as a single effort. While funders in conservation tend to gravitate towards, not away from the federal government, largely, largely because of leveraging opportunities, 
it is my experience that the federal agencies are either not equipped, not interested, or otherwise constrained from working with private funders. Federal government lacks the necessary culture for partnership. Why? Our experience is that private funders are generally seeking public partners to leverage their funds, ensure a strong scientific basis for their investments, identify strategic priorities, and provide appropriate oversight to ensure a project achieves the anticipated results once the funding has been initiated. The federal government is an attractive partner because it has financial resources, but more importantly, it has the ability to provide planning, science, strategy, and certainty of completion. As the executive director of the foundation, I oversee an entity that was created by Congress to specifically fund and find those partnerships. While the, fin while the foundation continues to experience a period of growth and success, um, we still are not able to maximize fully the federal partnerships that are out there. I'll submit the rest of my statement for the record. Thank you, uh, Mr. Trendle, uh, for the valuable contribution of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to conservation and for all of the work to develop and implement innovative public-private partnerships. And your complete statement will be entered into the record. Uh, to the uh, persons who are standing, you can be seated up here around the uh, table if you'd like. Right here. <laughs> Someday you may be able to <laughs> sit up here. I now uh, recognize uh, Dr. Kariva from the Nature Conservancy to testify for five minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for this opportunity. The Nature Conservancy, as many of you may know, is the world's largest conservation organization. And just one dimension of that is we own and manage over 1,400 private nature sanctuaries. That's a tremendous investment. And much of my job is geared towards providing scientific tools and decision support for how to protect that investment and other natural assets. And I just want to draw attention to a couple of examples of these, these decision-making tools and support. Uh, my written testimony goes into much greater detail. Let's start with the coastline. Seventy percent of the world's population lives along the coast and an equal percentage of the, world's of the world's economic activity is in coastal areas or in delta areas. And these are areas that are at risk from rising sea level, more extreme storms, and are getting heavily battered. They're vulnerable. They also are sites of important habitats and nursing grounds for fisheries. So the tools, the suite of tools that we develop for these marine coastlines are to identify what is vulnerable, identify what is valuable, and very clearly map some of the options and provide some guidance to the decisions that are before us. We have two examples of where we've played this out. One is in the Florida Panhandle, where we map wildlife, we map offshore habitat that could reduce storm surge. We also actually map vulnerable human communities, and that helps us establish priorities for actions that would protect nature and people. And we don't do any of this alone. A big partner in this is NOAA and, and universities. And other examples of Long Island Sound, where we detail some of the consequences of sea level rise and look at different adaptation strategies, different ways of responding to that threat and make clear the choices before us. So we don't just do maps of shoreline. The second tool I want to turn your attention to is what is called the Natural Capital Project. And this is a partnership where we rely on cutting edge science from Stanford University. And I like to think that we do the cutting edge implementation of that science. And again, it's maps. And again, it's decision support. But it's maps not just of the shoreline. It's maps of land and water use and infrastructure and energy development. And what we do is we value, econo we value economically ecosystem services, things like climate regulation, carbon sequestration, clean water, timber, agriculture, recreation. We map the landscape, we map alternative uses of the landscape, and translate it into cost-benefit analysis. And this has proven to be a very valuable tool 
to be able to see the consequences of the choices that are between us and to deal with those trade-offs you mentioned in your opening remarks. Um, we've applied it in several uh, countries around the world and are just beginning to apply these tools in the United States. And let me end by making one sort of general point about these tools. Uh, and this is more from my personal experience working with these mapping techniques and working in real places. In these times with water creeping up, storms being more severe, heat stress, and, and, and many of the other stresses we face, uh, it, you know, it's hard not to feel enormous anxiety, I guess you would say. But we have options. When you look at these maps, what you see is we do have options. The landscape isn't totally filled. There's more than one thing we could do. And it's my personal experience that often the best option is investing in natural ecosystems. It's the most cost effective and durable option in many cases. Not always, not always, for sure. For sure, sometimes there are engineering solutions and alternative solutions. But using these mapping techniques, looking at what is valuable, what is vulnerable, and what our options are, I think we can have a very effective investment strategy for our natural resources that benefit both the natural ecosystems and our economies and people's safety. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, much Dr. Uh, Kariva. Uh, your work in developing important applied tools is very encouraging. And our next witness uh, that will speak to us is Mr. Thompson from, the Stanford, from Stanford University. Mr. Thompson, the floor is yours. Please begin. our oceans and wildlife, climate change, competition from a growing set of land uses, including alternative energy development, reduced funding levels. All of these will require a shift in the character of the agencies that are responsible for the management of our oceans and land and the laws that are underpinning them. Today, separate agencies often manage separate sectors, sometimes with minimal coordination. In the oceans area, for example, one agency will manage the marine reserves, another agency will manage oil and gas development. We have something in the nature of 20 different agencies that are responsible for management in the federal oceans, additional ones on the state side. Today, most agencies focus on current needs and demands and don't necessarily have to plan ahead for future challenges. In administering some laws such as the Endangered Species Act, federal agencies are inevitably crisis driven. Today, conservation statutes generally do not admit of trade-offs among species. Today, managerial actions are largely static. Today, management decisions tend to focus on relatively small and sometimes isolated areas, not on broad ecological regions. Today, the funding that agencies have to undertake their responsibilities is often inadequate. The nature of the new challenges that are facing conservation efforts will require change. In the future, agencies with overlapping geographical jurisdictions will need to coordinate both to minimize conflicts between competing uses and also to maximize protection. In the future, agencies will need to be more proactive in anticipating the impacts of climate change and also competing uses. In the future, conservation agencies may need to engage in triage and recognize that some species inevitably will disappear. In the future, planning will need to be more comprehensive and in particular, focused on the creation of an integrated network of reserves. In the future, agencies will need to make greater use of adaptive management and unfortunately in the future, agencies will have to accomplish even more with actually fewer resources. These changes may in some cases require modification of existing laws or the adoption of new laws. In your letter of invitation to me, you asked for my views on the priorities for creating new legal frameworks. Thankfully, current laws provide significant discretion to existing agencies to accomplish many of the things that they need to do in the face of the challenges that you are examining. However, there are probably two priority areas that you may wish to review. The first is to see whether or not there is currently adequate authorization 
for the creation of integrated networks of reserves on both land and water that are climate aware. The second area would be to examine current laws to see whether or not there exists an adequate system at the moment for coordinating among the multiple federal agencies with responsibilities over activities on federal lands and oceans and for proactive planning on how to utilize such lands. There's reason, I think, for optimism. You already have a sizable number of laws that provide a foundation for agencies to do, again, what they will need to do in the future to address climate change, a growing number of competing uses, uh, and reduced funding. As you'll hear from the other witnesses, there are emerging tools to manage these various challenges. With that, I will submit my written testimony and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Thompson. And I now recognize Mr. Boffman to testify. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Hastings, members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify today. I'm John Boffman, a biologist by training, former director of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, former executive director of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies here in Washington, currently on the Sporting Conservation Council, which is a FACA committee that advises both the Secretaries of Interior and Agriculture on sportsmen's issues, including wildlife conservation. Over the past year, I've been involved in three parallel but independent efforts to formulate recommendations on fish and wildlife conservation for the new administration and Congress. The first is in my role at the Sporting Conservation Council, where we developed a series of white papers on eight of the biggest conservation issues of our time. Those are contained in a report entitled Strengthening America's Hunting Heritage and Wildlife Conservation in the 21st Century. Second effort worked with the American Wildlife Conservation Partners. That's a consortium of 42 conservation organizations to revise their recommendations for the Obama administration. They're in a report entitled Wildlife for the 21st Century, Volume 3. In the third effort, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies also came up with recommendations for the new administration and Congress. These, recommend, these represent the collective opinions of those agencies legally charged with the stewardship responsibility for the nation's fish and wildlife resources. All of those are contained in reports that accompanied my written testimony to the staff. While these efforts were independent, the recommendations were strikingly similar, and I've characterized the really big issues identified in all three. These are my characterization. One is global climate change. Two is maintenance of fish and wildlife habitat. Three, invasive species and diseases. Four, the disconnect between Americans and nature. And fifth, the lack of reasonable assured funding. Given the short time for oral testimony, I'll highlight just a few of the challenges and opportunities. Global climate change, certainly other entities will work on the causes and solutions to global climate change. The challenges for fish and wildlife conservation will be maintenance of functional ecosystems, lessening impacts of warmer world on at-risk species, and developing and implementing wildlife and habitat monitoring systems that are sensitive enough to allow us to identify and react to emerging impacts. Maintenance of fish and wildlife habitats, the challenges include, but certainly aren't limited to urban sprawl, increasing frequency of catastrophic fire, poorly managed land use practices such as agriculture and timbering, conversions from native habitat to agriculture, from agriculture to urban and suburban landscapes, impacts of energy development, and all of these are exacerbated by and in addition to the impacts of global climate change and invasives. Invasive species and diseases, the most important challenge is to stop the spread of invasives, but even more challenging will be the methods to control, manage, and or eradicate invasives once they're introduced. The disconnect between Americans and nature, we're raising a generation of Americans whose only link to nature comes from the TV screen or computer monitor. It's not surprising that childhood obesity is epidemic. Those who don't comprehend and understand a link between habitat and animals, man and nature, aren't likely to support the political and on-the-ground processes that ensure perpetuation of these resources. Lack of reasonable and assured funding, challenges are twofold. Less money available, lots more to do. At the turn of the last century, wildlife conservation was setting regulations, law enforcement, and stocking fish. Uh, and we had adequate resources from the revenues from hunters and anglers and appropriations from Congress for national programs. Now we have man, uh, preserving biodiversity, recovering species at risk, 
we have conservation education, we have uh, solving human wildlife conflicts, uh, controlling wildlife, human livestock diseases, and so forth. Uh, failure to act on any of these challenges will mean less wildlife, less and more fragmented habitat, more threatened and endangered species along with the regulatory and cost burdens, an unhealthier country and a greater long-term cost. Our opportunities under global climate change, I would say comprehensive legislation that addresses emissions of greenhouse gases, also generates revenues to drive the programs to identify and remedy impacts. Maintenance of fish and wildlife habitat, opportunity to work on the really big issues through landscape scale initiatives such as North American Waterfowl Management Plan, conservation features of the Farm Bill, National Fish Habitat Action Plan, Healthy Lands Initiative. Invasive species diseases, we need to secure comprehensive legislation to address importation, possession, and management of invasives. Disconnect between American and natures to support existing and create new programs and partnerships that encourage adults and children to participate in wildlife and nature-based outdoor recreation. Lack of reasonable assured funding, we need to improve the sustainability of traditional funding while working with state, federal, <coughs> and private partners to develop new sources of funding. In conclusion, there were dozens of excellent recommendations in the three reports I mentioned. <coughs> the new administration and Congress can make the needle move, that is make measurable on the ground differences in conservation, fish and wildlife resources if we seize a few big opportunities under each of my categories. But we have to do things a little different than we did in the 20th century. First, we need to address issues on a much larger landscape scale. Second, we need to work together better. Virtually all conservation needs to be delivered via partnerships. Third, we need to spend dollars more efficiently. Virtually all conservation dollars need to be leveraged. And fourth, with the contributions from hunters, anglers, and federal appropriations are no longer adequate as a primary source for funding conservation of all species for all Americans in the 21st century, new streams of adequate assured funding have to be developed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Boffman. And I want to commend all of our witnesses. They stayed within the time limit. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, your entire written statement will be included in the record. I um, will now recognize the members of the committee for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses, alternating between the majority and the minority, and allowing five minutes for each member. However, should the members need more time, we will have a second round of questions. I'll begin with myself, and I have just one question, uh, uh, three parts of it. Uh, to Mr. Trendell, you have testified that Congress should provide clear priorities of federal conservation goals and objectives in order to increase conservation funding from private sources. Now, how does NFWF establish its own conservation priorities? Uh, great question. Uh, we have within our staff a uh, scientific group, and uh, we have identified what we call keystone objectives. Uh, informing those keystone objectives for working alongside with the federal agencies as well as the conservation community to identify through a scientific process where we believe we can move the needle on particular species or particular habitats based upon the financial contributions we can invest into those areas. So it's called the keystone process and I can submit for the record a very detailed explanation of it. Very good. I I would okay. like to have that uh, sure. entered into the record. And the second part of the question, how can the goal-setting processes of NFWF and the federal government be made mutually reinforcing? Um, I believe it is a matter of really getting an, a spirit within the federal agencies to really pursue partnerships um, through the foundation or with other partners in order to bring together those private and public dollars, as well as everyone's science and wildlife plans and everything else. We're not short on planning, and we're not short on science. We're short on coordination, in my opinion. And then the third, uh, the third question, along the same lines, how would federal priorities improve the availability of funding from private sources? Um, what's happened is many private donors are very interested in partnering with the federal government. I'll use a real life example here just the last couple of months. We've been working with uh, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is an agency of the USDA. 
on a program that's called SAG, Conservation Innovative Grants, which is a $20 million a year grant program. Um, I've been trying for two years to get them to move it into the foundation so one, we could administer the grants much more efficiently, but more importantly, we could then turn and try to leverage it up with the corporate community. And in just gauging corporate interest and leveraging against that $20 million, we've had seven different companies come forward and say, yes, we would want to do that if you were able to do it. Now, we're still pursuing, and hopefully we'll be able to bring that into the agency. The thing to realize is there, the values within an agency aren't necessarily to partner. Partnerships cause complication and more work. Um, and the idea of bringing in more money is not necessarily enough of an incentive for agencies to enter into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Crandall. I have uh, another question, uh, just one more, for um, Dr. Kariva. And uh, again, um, Dr. Kariva, while the Nature Conservancy has developed some impressive tools for marine mapping and uh, planning, your testimony provided examples of data gaps that limit the ability of decision makers to use adaptive management strategies. Now, is this patchwork of data the critical limitation on adaptive management? In other words, why isn't adaptive management used more often? It, with NOAA, where I worked for the uh, um, fisheries and fisheries management as well, where that was a struggle. Uh, certainly, um, there are data gaps. In the marine system, uh, part of it is we, we don't have good maps yet for the whole coastline for the habitats and the resources. So the data is a limitation. I would say the other two limitations are um, strong incentives to the agencies to engage in it. Uh, it, 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 we talk about it a lot, but you really need sort of strong administrative incentives. Performance, have your performance based in your agency job on to the extent to which you do adaptive management. And the third thing is that adaptive management um, is new, and you need some tools to help people. Uh, you, you need some of the tools that we develop at, at the Nature Conservancy are meant to synthesize that information and present it in a way that is, doesn't overwhelm you with the complexity of the problem. And if you have those tools, I think people will be much more amenable to doing it if we make it easy for them. Incentivize and make it easy. A another part of the question, do tools and technology exist to effectively fill the critical data gaps? And can this be done in a cost-efficient manner? Prototypes of all the tools and data do exist. Um, with, I hesitate to, to, to give a time frame, but uh, in a relatively short time frame, you know, two to five years, we could fill the data gaps and get the, to the tools up to easy Im implementation and really on your desk anybody could use them, so I, I, in a very cost-effective manner. Most of the hard work has been done. Most of the in early investment, a lot of the hard work and research has been done. Thank you very much, Doctor. And now uh, I'd like to invite the person standing in the back to please come and be seated around the lower table here. And now I'd like to recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Hastings, for any questions he may have. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. I just want a couple of questions here. Uh, Mr. S uh, Trandall, you were, uh, and it's good to see you. Uh, good Jeff. to see you. Uh, <laughs> you had uh, mentioned uh, private and uh, public partnerships uh, several times in your testimony and in response to the uh, uh, chairwoman's, chairwoman's remarks. Uh, give me your um, assessment of the President's proposed budget that limits tax deductibility of those earning more than $250,000. Yeah, I expect to be going over to the Ways and Means Committee at some point. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as, as, the, as people are probably familiar, in the President's uh, sort of outline of a request, there's a, an idea of limiting uh, individuals who earn more than $250,000 a year, uh, limiting their tax deductibility to uh, nonprofits. And, um, uh, I personally would have great hesitation um, and disappointment if that were adopted as a concept. Uh, and from the foundation's perspective, it would be disastrous. Um, we, 
we rely on major gifts and obviously uh, corporate as well as federal dollars. And um, my average individual contribution is well in excess of $100,000 a year. It's not $5 a year. And um, you know we're working the very high end of the economy in order to generate uh, tens of millions of dollars back into conservation that's then in turn matched on the ground. So um, it would have a very uh, negative impact. And I spent my entire weekend actually putting together all the empirical data to kind of show exactly what it would do for us, but as well for others. Uh, I, I thank you for that. We're not the Ways and Means Committee, but I <laughs> felt that it was uh, it was worth uh, <laughs> worth at least asking. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I, I should just mention as well, um, this committee, uh, last Congress, expanded our board from 25 to 30, uh, which I have to say had exactly the impact that we were hoping for with the committee, which would be a dramatic increase again in the individual giving uh, for the foundations, which it did. It's had more than a million dollar impact. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, I want to ask a very broad question because this is a hearing on climate change that we haven't talked about what climate change is and how one looks ahead of it. My understanding is that most of the predictions are based on modeling data. And I want to put this, and I want you to respond to that, but I want to put it in real world terms because I was here last Thursday and I flew back to my home in Washington and I listened to the weather report for this weekend and they said it was going to cool down. There was absolutely no prediction uh, when I left on Thursday that you're going to have all of this snow here. So, uh, and I come back and I see that low records were set here during the week. So my, my question to you is, based on the data uh, long term, how can we have any confidence when we can't predict what just this last week, we didn't predict how cold it was going to be this weekend? So Mr. Hastings, this is uh, a very important question. Uh, question. Uh, because of the difficulties of predicting exactly what the impacts of climate change uh, will be on our oceans and wildlife in the uh, future, our first priority should clearly be to protect the fish and wildlife today. But we also have to recognize that climate change may very well impact those fish and wildlife uh, in the future. Scientists are already beginning to uh, uh, see what they believe uh, is an impact on the fish and wildlife today. And so that would suggest two things. First of all, that we be as adaptive as possible, recognizing that we're not that good at the moment at predicting into the, uh, uh, into the future, so that as we begin to see change, we can adjust to those uh, changes. And then second of all, we do know the general nature of impacts in the future. We know, for example, that species are likely to move, that they are likely in the United States to move north to uh, higher altitudes. And therefore, in thinking about the reserves that we are setting aside uh, and the coordination between federal actions, state actions, and the actions of organizations like the Nature Conservancy, we need to uh, be providing for that opportunity of movement. Uh, Madam Chairman, I see my time is about uh, out. I, I, my, my, my question was more how can we have confidence because we're going to make be potentially making huge decisions here. That's going to cost uh, individuals and taxpayers millions if not billions of dollars and, and, and yet we're doing it what appears to be on something that is not extremely solid uh, data. So, uh, Madam Chairman, I will, uh, I will, I have other questions and I'll wait for the second round, but I, uh, and maybe Mr. Thompson, I'd ask you to rethink that. I understand the impact that uh, probably everybody feels uh, on climate change. After, after all, history, uh, long before humans were here, uh, climate change had an effect on the species uh, in the world. So that, I think that's self-evident. The question is, is how do we make these determinations uh, based on, on good data? And I guess that's what the question is. But thank you very much, and thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chairman. Thank the uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Hastings, in the state of Washington. I would like to just introduce a few new members that have come in. Uh, we have Mr. Sablon uh, from the uh, Northern Marianas, uh, and we have uh, Mr. Pierre Luisi from Puerto Rico, and Mr. Whitman, the state of Virginia. 
And now I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Lois Capps. Thank you, Madam Chair. And may I say at the outset, uh, congratulations on this hearing, uh, the topics and the esteemed uh, testifiers, uh, managing our oceans and wildlife resources. This is a very valuable to have as we confront the 111th Congress and our new administration and with the goal of establishing some priorities. I would like to turn to uh, Dr. Kariva, if I could please um, and uh, commend you as an organization amongst many uh, who have worked very closely to set aside millions of acres of land and water as habitat for plants birds, fish, other animals. You've been working in Morro Bay in my congressional district uh, dealing with marine protection and by the way you've also been working on that endangered uh, uh, group, the fishing community um, through sustainable fishing that you've partnered with environmental defense, a very novel and I think very worthwhile approach which actually touches on some of the things we're talking about here. I would like to ask if you could describe for us what a failure to act on climate change, a little t different take on it from the previous question, uh, what a failure to act or delayed action would mean for the ability of existing marine protected areas and wildlife preserves to protect wildlife and sensitive ecosystems. First I'd like to say. Uh, and, and as you're thinking of your answer, I, I, let me, I can maybe focus it a little more specifically. Um, how would climate change of impact the national marine sanctuaries, for example? I have two sanctuaries in my district, uh, the Channel Islands and Monterey Bay, the tip of Monterey Bay Sanctuary. As you know, national marine sanctuaries are set up to be some of the best examples of ecosystem-based management. They will be affected by climate change. Maybe that's a good uh, way t to approach this question. Okay, so f uh, first uh, I, I want to um correct sort of a misimpression. We actually have very good data and science about climate change. We don't about weather. There's a distinction between yes. weather and climate change. Weather is what happened, you know, here in D.C. the last couple of days. Climate change is long-term trends and expectations. So in any given year, any given day, in any given week, uh, you might be surprised, but it's the long-term averages we're dealing with climate change. Yes. So, so, so turning to the, the marine protected areas, um, and, and just the marine resources in general, it's quickly becoming evident that's that, that uh, our marine systems are some of our most vulnerable, and they're vulnerable from a number of reasons. They're vulnerable uh, in coral reefs because sea, uh, rising sea surface temperatures stresses and, and kills the coral. They're vulnerable because they change currents and upwelling patterns, and thus they change the fisheries that we harvest. Um, and they're, they're um, vulnerable because some species um, shift their, their distributions. And in fact, it's been noticed along the California coast that species will shift their distributions. As a result of that, if we have a marine protected area set up in one place for a suite of species we're trying to manage, and as a result of climate change, the physical conditions change, are altered, that place will no longer provide protection for those species. So it's going to be a challenge to management in that we won't just be able to rely on fixed marine protected areas. We're going to de need much more sophisticated management like uh, zoning and some of the innovative techniques we, we have. But we already have good data showing shifts in distributions, showing uh, stresses in offshore habitats that are tightly linked to climate change in the last 30 years. And there will be surprises, for sure. And, and we will be surprised. But I think we know generally, strategically, how to approach the problem. Thank you. Another justification for having these areas because of the data that you're able to collect in an intensive That's way. That's right. We do monitor those places. I want to uh, talk about sanctuaries. I happen to, this is a little self-serving <laughs> question from me. I'm co-chair of our newly formed caucus on marine, National Marine Sanctuaries. The other co-chair is Eliana ross Layton, and I represent a Pacific district. She represents a district uh, in Florida. Um, the sanctuaries are applying the principles of eco-based ecosystem-based management, I understand, uh, to, diver to manage their diverse set of natural res resources and ecosystem services. Um, uh, maybe you'd talk about this a little bit. It, 
as a follow-up to the previous question, and more specifically, how are sanctuaries using ecosystem-based management to meet the growing threat of climate change? And, and what they do then could, is important for its own sake, clearly because of, of their status, but also as an example and a model for other, uh, other areas. So ecosystem-based management uh, um, is jargon for, um, I guess you would say, uh, trying to achieve many purposes with one sanctuary mm -hmm. and balancing those purposes uh, using the best science. And in doing that in a very transparent way, so it's also clear to the stakeholders that are involved. So early on in the history of marine protected areas, it might have been thought they were just for biodiversity or just for one species. No longer is that the case. You look at the entire ecosystem and the many services they provide. So shoreline ecosystems, as an example, they provide fisheries for commercial fisheries, they provide sport fishing, they provide recreation, they can provide habitats that reduce storm surge mm -hmm. and protect human communities. So you would look at all those natural assets and you'd look at the economics and the stakeholders only. That's what ecosystem-based management is, looking at the many different interests in the sanctuaries. The other thing that, that for the federal ones that have been set up that is especially valuable is they are well monitored. We've invested money into collecting information and I think of them as probably our best sentinels for climate change. We have two few places in the world where we're collecting comprehensive information and we'll be able to um, see before it's too late what's going on. So they also serve that purpose, uh, although maybe that wasn't originally what they were set up for. Thank you very much. I've used my time, but Madam Chair, um, that of course prompts with me uh, a follow-up, an additional question, uh, what kind of resources, do we have enough resources if this is indeed that critical for advice to the uh, new administration and to our 111th Congress, do we need additional resources for the kind of information that you're going to be able to supply? And, but I'll yield back. Thank you. We will have a second round. I thank the gentlelady from California. I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'd like to begin by yielding to the ranking member, Mr. Hastings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Whitman. I, Mr. Buffman, I want to ask you a, a question real briefly. In your uh, oral testimony, you talked about uh, regulating greenhouse re uh, emissions. Could you, could, you e could you elaborate on what your recommendations would be on that? Well, Matt, I think that if you recall my testimony, the part of it is that there's other people working on the emissions of greenhouse gases other than the wildlife conservation community. I think our bigger task was reacting to those impacts on the communities and maintaining those functional ecosystems. I'm not an expert on it, but certainly some of these carbon trading uh, protocols, um, carbon credits, I think those are the most, uh, I, th I think there's promise in some of those protocols. There's always the devil in the details of things that have to be worked out. You mentioned the tremendous costs of some of those. We need to look at the tremendous benefits of some of those protocols too. There's always someone paying things, receiving money. There's a money end of it, but there's also the behaviors and outcomes end of that equation too. And we need to look at the whole picture to where whatever protocols are adopted, those things balance and the, and the, the net is a positive effect for the country. Good, uh, thank you very much. And I yield back to my friend. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bauman, um, you've had over 30 years of experience in the area of wildlife conservation. Can you tell us what you believe the overall impact of climate change is having on our wildlife? Well, I'm most directly, of course, familiar with the west, the Rocky Mountain West, and, and certainly the last 15 years has been warmer and drier than any uh, situation we've witnessed. In, and in fact, I think the records document it just has been warmer and drier than any period in the last 500 years. And we have seen species decrease in abundance. We have seen entire habitats devastated, uh, trying to manage through drought for 15 years. Our systems of timbering, our systems of public land livestock, they just break down. They were never, they were never meant to operate that way. And we have not adopted behaviorally or economically to some of those systems. And some of the net results the whole country is looking at are uh, species like sage grouse becoming listed as threatened and endangered and the impacts that would have, I think the northern spotted owl would pale in comparison. Uh, we're, our mule deer are in jeopardy. Um, all of these high uh, grassland steppe uh, species are at risk. But, but in the whole country, there, there are just 
species and, and habitats that evolved in much wetter, uh, cooler times, and, and things are moving, things are changing, like some of the other speakers talked about. Things are disappearing. Now, you'd spoken earlier about to making sure we get our children out from behind televisions and computer screens, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's um, high time that our, that our youth be uh, as acquainted as they can with our outdoor environment. I wanted to um, sort of pick your brain about how do you think we can best achieve that? I think there has to be an understanding from top to bottom about, obviously, about the issue of climate change, but also how that affects our, our natural environments. And we have to have, I think, people plugged in from top to bottom as far as the spectrum of age. So if you could give us a little, of, a little bit of your thoughts about how we can make sure we can fully engage folks, and that includes our youth. Well, certainly there are some really good programs out there, and there's some really good programs emerging. Congress, the administration doesn't have to do everything, but it would be nice for them to be partners in these efforts. And I think the most important needs and probably the biggest successes we have is, one, developing some national conservation environmental education standards, that there's, that there's some concepts and principles that every child, every citizen of America understands. We don't have that. And the second is concentrating on opportunities as this country becomes more urban and we get more kids with that computer monitor and TV screen uh, and access becomes tougher, not only the legal access to public and private lands, but just the difficulties of getting out of the beltway to find a place to recreate. We have to focus on, again, through partnerships, on developing those opportunities that people know about and they're easy to take advantage of. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I'd now like to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Mrs. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing, and, and thank you to our witnesses today. I'd like to um, begin by welcoming our former clerk of the House, Jeff Trandall, <laughs> who is now representing, is now the executive director of the Fish National uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation. Um, before I ask a question, I, I um, and I'll ask this in sort of a question, I have H Concurrent Resolution 2. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, I know we're talking today about specific uh, uh, legislative changes and, uh, and um, administrative changes that are needed, but this would express a sense of Congress that um, the Fish and Wildlife um, Service in particular should incorporate consideration of global warming and sea level rise into comprehensive conservation plans for coastal national wildlife refuges and for other purposes. And Madam Chair, we're working with your staff to, to move this through the committee, but is that something that uh, your panelists would support? At least as a beginning step, getting the Congress to recognize, and we could expand it to include you know, all planning if, if, if we so recommend. Um, Mr. Trandall, you focus a lot on the need for uh, clear and synchronized um, goals, um, and s for one reason, be one reason being that it's a barrier you felt to the kind of public-private partnerships you're charged to create. And Mr. Thompson, I think you also referenced the same concern. I can understand within within agencies the need for consistent and clear goals but across different agencies with somewhat different missions and different oversight, I'm not sure are there, if that can be done um, successfully. Are there some key overarching areas that you would want to suggest that a park service, a BLM, a fish and wildlife could have clear goals that are synchronized with each other? First down, and it's always great seeing you. <laughs> Prefer to see you in the Virgin Islands, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, first, I want to start and say I do think that the need of coordination among the agencies is incredibly important. And it's going to take leadership from one agency in particular, which I think the Department of Interior is the agency that should lead it. The good news to me and the optimism is Secretary Salazar has spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks in particular talking about his America's Treasures concept, of which he's talking about exactly the same thing, creating a priority list of habitats, ecosystems, actions that are potentially should become federal priorities and agencies should 
look at those priorities to try to do a better job in working with one another. Um, an example I would give just right off the top is invasive species. Um, a lot of money is spent at USDA. A lot of money is spent at the Department of Interior to deal with invasive species. But I have yet to see the Department of Transportation do anything. Yet, how do they get there? Well, they normally arrive through a transportation system, a highway, a plane, a boat. Um, and if we were able to coordinate better and get the agency sort of at the front end of the problem involved, I think we would find ourselves in a much more successful position down the road and hopefully save money instead of just trying to manage through a problem. I, I, and I was thinking just under interior. I wasn't even thinking about departments okay. outside, but we're actually employing the same kind, trying to get the same kind of coordination on healthcare issues. Right, because right. there are many ways that other agencies other than DHHS can um, co collaborate and coordinate and within the department also um, to address those issues. Dr. Kariva, um, as you know, we, the, um, Nature Conservancy has been doing a lot of work in the Virgin Islands. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the multi-objective marine management approaches um, that you talked about. Your re remarks referenced the utility of such techniques in places such as Long Island and Florida. But what about in a smaller community like ours or Culebra, um, which my colleague, uh, Mr. Perlusi uh, represents, and where I understand you may be partnering uh, with an organization shortly, um, where single objective approaches such as coral farming or small-scale small community conservation projects have been quite successful. Are these approaches transferable to smaller communities like ours, and can they support what are sometimes unique and often cultural concerns? and their support then for doing the research and development. But uh, as we get better at the tools, of course, uh, what they really are about is balancing competing needs and making clear the trade-offs and the consequences of decisions. So instead of making a decision yes, no, the decision is what are, what's your full suite of options to meet everybody's needs? And those needs um, for sure include cultural values, um, what impact on family structure in some of the Pacific Islands we worked on, paying attention to role of women in the community, impact on family structure, and uh, household surveys. What, what are the consequences for household satisfaction? Uh, and I think you will see these tools in a second generation uh, be widely used across scales, not just for Long Island and not just for Florida. I think it's a general, it's common sense. It's, it, it's really a common sense vision supported by science and transparent presentation of information. I think my time is up. Thank you um, for your responses. Thank you, Madam. I thank the uh, gentlelady from Virgin Islands. Now I'd like to recognize the um, uh, ranking member, Mr. Whitman from Virginia. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'd like to go back to Mr. Boffman again and um, Talk a little bit about the President's budget submission. As you know, he's uh, set aside some dollars for wildlife adaptation. And of that, it designates 31 percent of those dollars will go to the states. And considering that states have primacy over wildlife resources in their state, would it be more judicious if the split were 50-50 rather than 31 percent going to the states as far as utility and getting dollars down to make meaningful impacts uh, on wildlife adaptation? Yes. <laughs> I, you, I, you know, I'm really not familiar with that, so I, w I wouldn't be, um, I'd be out of my league to comment right now without doing a little homework on that. But in general, uh, the, the conservation programs are developed and run more efficiently, and like most forms of government, the more local we get in the delivery. And so I would, I would certainly favor that. But there are certainly roles for the federal dollars, private dollars, state dollars, and there's programs where all those entities kind of take the lead. 
and do it very well and and we just need to segregate and figure out who's best at doing what but on all programs as long as we're working together maybe the end outcome isn't going to be that different where it goes and the other panel members have a comment uh, on how the funding should take place for under wildlife adaptation thank you madam chairman thank the gentleman for his questions i have um, a couple of questions before we go into any further questions from the uh, members uh, for mr thompson uh, this has to do with climate change and adaptive management. How will incorporating climate change projections into programs and plans enhance our ability to manage ocean and wildlife resources? So, Madam Chair, I think there are, are two important uh, issues here. Uh, the first one is the importance of integrating what we already know about the likely impacts of climate change into the current management plans. That would suggest that we need, for example, a network of uh, reserves on both the marine side and the land side uh, that permit species to adjust uh, over time. As Dr. Kariva mentioned earlier, given uh, the likely impact of climate change, fixed uh, reserves that are relatively uh, isolated will not be as effective as they were in the past. Uh, so we need a broader network of reserves. In California, for example, under the Marine Life Protection Act, we're currently setting up reserves along the entire California coast, uh, which are integrated and are likely to be far more effective uh, in addressing climate change. The second uh, aspect, though, is in addition to taking climate change into account in our current plans, we also have to always be ready in the future uh, to adjust uh, our uh, management efforts to take into account the new information and the surprises that will come along. Uh, Mr. Thompson, a second part of the question, what lessons can be learned and applied at a federal level from California's Marine Life Protection Act? So there's several lessons that I think can be learned from the uh, Marine Life Protection Act. The first one is the importance of having a very explicit directive uh, to establish a set of uh, uh, marine uh, reserves. Uh, the second is to establish a process uh, for setting up those marine reserves uh, which are effective. When California first started implementing its uh, uh, Marine Life Protection Act, for example, uh, the um, uh, agencies uh, did not fully consult with uh, stakeholders, and as a result, it wasn't that effective of a process. Today, we have a process where, first of all, uh, the state is going region by um, uh, region uh, and looking to uh, uh, see what the uh, uh, set of marine reserves should look like uh, in each of those uh, areas. And it has set up a very clear uh, uh, process that involves a scientific advisory committee and a stakeholders group and a blue ribbon uh, task force to in each of those uh, uh, regions uh, help to shape what those reserves are going to look like. And then finally, there are a clear set of deadlines by which action is actually supposed to be taken. Very good. Uh, I also have um, for Dr. or Mr. Boffman, you recommend that the Congress take action to screen and prevent the introduction of invasive species. Now, does the Sporting Conservation Council support my legislation, H.R. 669, which would address that particular gap? I'd, I have not read the legislation, and I know that Council has not done a thorough analysis of it, but certainly the concepts uh, we would support. And as you know, perhaps better than I do, that that is a tough, tough challenge to first uh, control the spread of those invasives around this planet and then even tougher to try to control things once we have them. It, it is an overwhelming, um, overwhelming task with uh, challenges that are just 
mind-boggling how to, how to address some of these things once they're introduced. But yes, again, the devil, the devil is also in the detail. <laughs> I, I think there's still some work, as there always is in Congress, to be done before a fine, fa <coughs> fine piece of legislation goes out the door. Well, I suggest you uh, read the bill and uh, give us your comments. So noted. Thank you. The chair wishes to welcome uh, Mr. Kildee from Michigan, uh, who's uh, entered uh, and just in time for our second panel. Are there any other questions? Uh, gentlelady from Virgin Islands, do you have any other questions? Uh, then I wish to thank the witnesses for being with us this morning and um, would uh, like to welcome the second panel of witnesses. For anyone who is standing in the back of the room, please come forward and be seated here in the uh, lower level here. There are many chairs. As chairwoman, I now recognize our second panel of witnesses, Dr. Shirley Pomponi, executive director of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, Dr. William Jackson, deputy director general, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, Mr. Franklin Nutter, president of the Reinsurance Association of America, and Dr. Brian Rothschild, Montgomery Charter professor of marine science Professor, School of Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. As a reminder to the second panel of witnesses, I would note for all of you that the red timing light on the table will indicate when five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. However, a reminder that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. And now I'd like to begin with the first witness of the second panel, Dr. Pomponi. Please begin. Good morning, Chairwoman Bardalo and members of the subcommittee. My name is Shirley Pomponi, and I'm the director of Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University. Today I'm providing my perspective as a career oceanographer, chair of the Board of Trustees of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, and chair of the Ocean Studies Board of the National Research Council. The ocean covers two-thirds of our planet. It's the driving force behind climate and weather. It provides oxygen, food, recreation, and highways for commerce, and significantly contributes to our nation's economic regime. As we have come to better appreciate the complexity of marine ecosystems, we've developed new approaches to ocean management that seek to balance the human uses of coastal and ocean environments while maintaining the integrity of marine ecosystems. I'm going to highlight five priority areas for managing our ocean resources. First, ecosystem-based management, about which we've heard quite a bit this morning already. This uh, recognizes the complex interactions of the entire ecosystem rather than just a single fishery. The, main, the many aspects of human interactions with the oceans are also taken into consideration in resource management decisions. Although not a new concept, we've not made significant progress toward realizing ecosystem-based management in our current regulatory regimes. Marine protected areas are an essential component of ecosystem-based management that could provide some insurance against over-harvesting. In addition to committing to the establishment of marine protected areas, we must also ensure that there is continuing support for science to monitor their effectiveness. Second. In the ongoing debates about climate change and how to mitigate and adapt to its effects, the role of the ocean and the impact of climate change are often overlooked. 
One example is sequestration of carbon dioxide. While the processes by which the ocean absorbs CO2 are well understood, the impact of a more acidic ocean on critical o ocean ecosystems like coral reefs is not known. I want to thank this committee for its leadership in passing the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act last year. As the committee considers climate change and energy legislation, I ask you to include provisions for funding to support research and monitoring activities to better understand the effect of climate change on the ocean. Third, the ocean plays an important role in human health. Harmful alg algal blooms produce toxins that not only affect fish and marine mammals, but also humans who eat fish or shellfish or simply visit a beach during a bloom. A renewed emphasis on research into the mechanisms of transmission of waterborne pathogens and toxins and the effects of climate and weather patterns on ocean and human health would provide public health officials with the tools and information that they need to prevent human exposure to illness, both in coastal communities and hundreds of miles inland. Fourth, by integrating existing ocean observing and monitoring systems and expanding the system to incorporate new sources of data, we can combine information from regional systems into one national integrated ocean observing system and provide multiple scales of information to a variety of end users, from ship captains to coastal resource managers to recreational fishers and public health officials. A critical need is to expand and sustain the basic components of the integrated observing system, including a national commitment to a program of satellite observations from space, coupled with an investment in our academic research fleet to support simultaneous in situ observations. A robust integrated ocean observing system will fundamentally alter our ability to understand, conserve, and manage our ocean resources and will enable ocean forecasting, ecosystem-based management, and adaptive management during the next decade. Fifth, I'd like to emphasize the need for continued coordination among the 25 federal agencies that conduct or fund ocean research. A coordinated mechanism for interagency OMB budget reviews would ensure that interagency priorities are included in budget planning for individual agencies. A comprehensive interagency review as part of the annual budget process would help ensure that the full suite of ocean research priorities is addressed. In conclusion, we've drawn down our ocean assets. We now need to reinvest in and recommit to the health of our ocean planet. The oceans are finite and cannot indefinitely withstand stresses of overfishing, climate change, and pollution. New technologies to map, explore, and observe the ocean will enable us to achieve ecosystem-based and adaptive management, restore the health of the ocean, and indeed our planet. Chairwoman Bordalo and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you and on behalf of the ocean science community, I look forward to working with you to provide the science to conserve our ocean planet for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paponi, for your testimony and also thank you for the many dedicated years working to advance marine science. And I now recognize Dr. Jackson from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature to testify for five minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee. Madam Chairwoman, Chairwoman you began your opening statement with talking about the financial crisis. And I think this crisis has provided us with a, a very stark reminder of how the loss of assets can affect our livelihoods, but also undermine our capacity to make choices. It's shown that early warning signals often go unheeded and until a crisis is upon us, and that when we do have a collapse, it can be very rapid and very far-reaching. I think if we compare the financial crisis with the state of our natural resources, we see some alarming similarities. For many years, we've been told that our forests, our rivers, and our oceans are stressed, and unfortunately, we tend to ignore these early warning signals. Thus, look at how 70% of the world's fisheries are depleted or overexploited. Yet in some areas, fishing industry continues to intens intensify their efforts, uh, opening up new species and new areas. The IUCN Red List of Threatened Species tells us that nearly 40% of the animals and plants that we've assessed globally are threatened with extinction. And we know that since 1900, the world has lost about half of its wetlands and about 60% of coral reefs could be lost by 2030. Having the right information is the key to the subcommittee. Acting on that information, even more important. 
the consequences of ecosystem degradation have far-reaching impact on human well-being. Climate change, for example, has global reach, but poor countries are more least, uh, sorry, least able to cope with this. This, in turn, will have a major impact on human security issues through food and water scarcity and through ensuing migration. When fisher people stop fishing because there's no fish left, and they start using their boats to ferry refugees, you know we've reached another tipping point. Technology is critical in reversing climate change, but we must be careful not to put all of our eggs in the technology basket. Some technologies will definitely work, others won't. Some will be economic, others won't. But whether we talk about climate change mitigation or adaptation, conserving natural resources is a safety net that we should never lose. While climate change rightly dominates the headlines today, ecosystem degradation will do so tomorrow if we don't act now. Economies can recover, loss of biodiversity is irreversible. Biodiversity can do for the planet what a healthy immune system can do for us as individuals. It helps us to adapt to change, but if it doesn't function properly, it makes us more vulnerable. We have many years and thousands of years indeed of experience in using nature to help us to grow our food, to provide us with clean water and medicines, and to protect us from natural hazard. We know that investing in ecosystems can yield multiple benefits at the same time. For example, in a fight against climate change, restoring forest ecosystems not only stores large amounts of carbon, but can directly improve the resilience of poor people's livelihoods and therefore reduce impacts. We know enough about marine ecosystems to create far more effective national and international management mechanisms to halt the decline and maintain resilience so that they can have a better chance of coping with climate change. The bottom line, we need to act urgently on the existing knowledge we have while increasing, at the same time, understanding of natural processes. What is it that you can do as lawmakers? The first answer to me is fairly obvious and the one that fits with the new administration's stated intentions, you can invest in knowledge, you can support research. This committee has a special interest in oceans. Your support for time series data on fisheries, pollution and climate variability to allow us to better understand the impacts of climate change on marine ecosystems is essential. We need to understand processes such as acidification and the interaction between oceans and the climate system Research itself is not enough. The US has traditionally shown leadership in ocean resource management, and I encourage you to renew that leadership role. This is particularly important for the Arctic. The US also needs to send strong messages into the international multilateral system, and particularly the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the upcoming climate negotiations. Most importantly, you can perhaps do a lot by integrating in the committee's own thinking the idea of investing in nature as infrastructure. Perhaps that is part of your new paradigm. In short, you have to make biodiversity integral to every project and every piece of legislation you work on. The US can lead by example in making these necessary interventions. The International Union of Conservation of Nature stands ready to help you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson, and I'm very encouraged by your testimony and congratulate your organization for developing important products that deliver critical data to decision makers on the ground. And now I'd like to recognize Mr. Nutter. It is a pleasure to welcome you this morning and you can proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be uh, here before the committee today and offer our perspective on managing risk by promoting the conservation of our natural resources and through risk mit mitigation efforts along our densely populated coastlines. Uh, in simple terms, reinsurance is the insurance of insurance companies. Uh, one of its primary functions is to provide transfer for insurers for major natural catastrophe risk. Uh, for example, in 2005 with Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, uh, nearly 61 percent of all of the insured losses paid by the insurance industry were transferred to the reinsurance market. The insurance industry's financial interest is interdependent with climate and weather. It is the risk of natural events that drives the demand for insurance coverages, yet if not properly managed can threaten the financial health of an insurer if it is overexposed in high-risk areas. 
as has been mentioned by several witnesses, the insured property along our coastlines has risen dramatically. One study estimated it has nearly doubled every decade, and at the end of 2007, our estimates are that the privately insured property values along the Gulf and Atlantic coast totaled nearly $9 trillion. And of course, economic losses associated with natural catastrophes has risen dramatically. With 30 percent of the U.S. population living in coastal counties that are exposed to extreme, extreme events, global climate change will only increase this exposure and potential losses. Congress should help people living in hurricane-prone coastal areas take proactive mitigation steps to protect their property rather than encourage further development in these high-risk, environmentally sensitive locales by creating taxpayer-funded programs to subsidize insurance. Our organization has partnered with, with other diverse interest groups to create the Americans for Smart Natural Catastrophe Policy to promote environmentally responsible, physically sound approaches to natural catastrophe policy in the interest of public safety. I have listed a number of our partners in this, including uh, the National Wildlife Federation, American Rivers, Defenders of Wildlife, Friends of the Earth, uh, Republicans for Environmental Protection, the Sierra Club, and most recently the Nature Conservancy as part of that coalition. And it stands for the following principles, that we should build smart according to the most modern building standards and codes reflecting exposure to natural catastrophe disasters and cost-effective loss reduction measures, promote risk avoidance and proactive mitigation measures, protect both the public and ecosystems that provide natural buffers to storms, renewed efforts should be made to preserve coastal areas consistent with effective state and federal laws, and also to provide uh, to ensure based upon risk, private and public property insurance should be established based upon risk exposure. While our coalition members have differing priorities, we all agree that certain actions being considered by Congress may have a detrimental impact on oceans, coastal systems, and wildlife. Our coalition uh, opposed proposals to expand the National Flood Insurance Program to include wind coverage, largely because it would overwhelm a program that is already $18 billion in debt and encourage further development in unsafe or environmentally sensitive areas. There are many steps that we can take to mitigate losses and protect our oceans, coastal, and wildlife resources. In among them include incorporating climate change and risk assessment and risk mitigation that is translated to local levels, particularly for the mapping of flood, shoreline, and inundation areas. We should require risk-based land use planning and the integration of natural hazards into land use planning. We should design infrastructure to consider natural hazards and climate change. Our organization is also part of a building code coalition whose goal is to enact legislation to amend the Stafford Act by encouraging states to adopt nationally recognized model building codes for residential and commercial structures. During this year's consideration of the economic stimulus package, our coalition supported an increase in funding to FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation program to provide funds to states for community-based hazard mitigation activities. We also advocated uh, for efforts to ensure that infrastructure projects funded through federal appropriations consider and incorporate measures to reduce the risk of potential impacts of natural disasters. Our coalition supports the Coastal Barrier Resources System, which prevents structures proposed for construction in undeveloped, environmentally pristine areas from purchasing federal flood insurance. The Coastal Zone Management Act could provide a tool, essentially a climate adaptation tool, to ensure states are planning for potential risks posed by the impacts of climate change. If blended with state mitigation plans already required by the Stafford Act and approved by FEMA, the combination provides states with the planning tools they need to develop and implement a climate adaptation policy. Lastly, I would like to commend the committee for recognizing the importance of risk mitigation to conservation of our ocean, coastal ecosystems, and wildlife resources in an increasingly dynamic and unpredictable environment. Clearly, all stakeholders must work together to make sure that we have environmentally sound and physically responsible policy that will ultimately reduce costs borne by the federal and state governments, insurers, and American taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nutter. And I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Rothschild to testify. Please begin. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Committee. I've been asked to address information products, services, and tools to address conservation and to protect protect and conserve the ocean. In the early 1900s, conservation was a concept. At, at the time, many people thought our natural resources were unlimited. This suppressed actions that would have prevented irreversible effects of human activity that we see today. Clearly, the global, global human population explosion 
Consequent saturation of the atmosphere and ocean with pollutants and mismanagement of resources places conservation beyond a mere concept. Conservation is now an imperative. The conservation imperative requires action. This is easy to say but difficult to implement. The difficulty arises from the fact that we do not have the budget resources to address the total array of conservation problems. As a result, we have to focus on the problems that are most critical. We have to ask the right questions. It is not so easy to conduct the concrete analysis required to identify the most critical questions. We have to produce the concrete quantitative analysis necessary to ensure that we're making the best program investments. Let us take an example from fisheries. The Magnuson-Stevens Act uh, has uh, a number of goals. One is to eliminate overfishing, two is to fully utilize optimum yield, and three is to take account of the economic and social fabric of fishing uh, communities. To take these goals seriously and efficiently balance them, we need to fill in uh, serious and material shortfalls in our information base. For example, standard fishing conservation and management practices only account for being able to manage one species at a time. Uh, we don't have the techniques to manage the interaction between two species, let alone a whole ecosystem. The techniques do not account for changes in physical environments, something as simple as water temperature are not, are not accommodated in fishery management. Fishery management techniques do not presently account for ecosystems and as a consequence can't really deal with the issues of climate change. The uh, fishery management uh, techniques that are used don't take into account e economics even and sociology even though, that even though these are well-known uh, components of fishing. And finally, there's not an end-to-end -end systems engineering approach to ensuring coordinated and coherent cost-effective management of the entire process. In my view, we need a three-year uh, effort to retool fishery management. The effort would be initiated with the creation of three centers that focus on our greatest shortfalls in science, engineering, and technology. The first uh, center would be a National Center for Ocean Ecosystem Research, which would uh, focus, organize, and program in an in-depth understanding of ocean ecosystems uh, particularly as they relate to uh, fisheries and uh, the waste sink uh, capacity of the ocean in a, an environment that's uh, changing because of the climate. A second national center for fishery, man fishery management systems would develop a systems engineering approach to fishery management, included, including the end-to-end -end balancing of uh, data acquisition, uh, control rules for management, and dissemination of information to uh, managers, uh, legislators, and the fishermen. And finally, a National Center for Fishery Engineering would focus on the green issues of improving the efficiency of fishing gear, separating good fish from bad fish, uh, big fish from little fish, reducing bycatch, and improving fuel utilization, and less influence of bottom-tending bottom gear on the, uh, on the uh, bottom organisms. I see the creation of these centers uh, by using existing resources and personnel. The answers to the questions that were posed essentially relate uh, to creating a capability. That's what these uh, three uh, centers are intended to do, is to create a cap capability which does not presently exist to address the most uh, critical conservation issues using our fishery resources as a model. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rothschild. And I will now recognize members for any questions that they may wish to ask uh, in this. Uh, we'll alternate between the majority and the minority members. I'll begin uh, with a few questions for uh, Dr. Pomponi. Uh, your testimony outlines several areas of research that need further study to make adaptive management more effective and enhance our ability to predict impacts of climate change. Can you prioritize these research needs? Probably the, the greatest need, well, in fact, probably the greatest need would be to, to get a, a better understanding 
of uh, kind of the baseline data, but I think the greatest, th to, to enable us to do that, I think we're going to have uh, to develop the infrastructure, put the infrastructure in place. We've already got part of that in place in terms of our observing systems, but I think being able to uh, establish a, a regional approach that's integrated across many regions to be able to provide the data so that we can effectively communicate among regions and uh, uh, tr uh, convert those data into information that can be used by resource managers, I think is going to be probably the greatest priority. So improving the infrastructure on the current infrastructure. Yes. All right. Now, how will these critical research programs facilitate better decision making with regard to the threats of sea level rise and ocean acidification? I think if we're going to uh, adapt, we need to know what we're adapting to. Um, and, and as I mentioned, that requires data and models and predictions. Um, if we, uh, what, what we expect is going to happen in terms of sea level rise is there'll be habitat loss, there'll be uh, shifting ecosystems. That's going to affect not only our natural resources, it's going to affect our, 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 uh, infrastructure, our infrastructure, our coastal infrastructure, public health, national security. Um, we need to reduce those uncertainties in our predictions in terms of sea level rise. Um, we, we need to reduce the uncertainties into what marine life is going to survive in a warmer and more acidic ocean environment. So those are the that's the type of information that we need to provide to better formulate our predictive models and be able to provide um, more information so that we can uh, ad manage to these change, uh, ad adaptively manage to these changes in the environment. And doctor, what new technologies are on the horizon that will enable better ocean management? I think uh, th there are some exciting new biological and genomic sensors that are going to help us tags that we can put on 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 uh, on uh, larger animals, uh, um, uh, more sophisticated molecular tools that help us to understand what's actually living in the ocean environment. From an engineering standpoint, gliders that enable us to to um, assess the environment on a more comprehensive scale, on a broader scale. Um, I think that. It's important for us to maintain the continuity of our remote sensing data. So satellite observations from space are going to be extremely important to continue that, to, to make a commitment to continue that. And I think mo probably even most important out of this is we need to make sure we can get the agencies to coordinate acquisition of data, the management of data, and the dissemination of those data to our end users. I think more than anything else, I mean, we've got information, we've got data, we need to be able to coordinate we that. To share it. Yes, mm -hmm. and share it, get it back in a usable format to the users. Wh what are your immediate and long-term infrastructure needs and how can we reduce the costs? <laughs> um, I, probably the, the, the more immediate ones are um, getting the ocean observing system in place and making sure that we've got an integrated system across the United States it's going to be costly. It, it really is. And so the key here is going to be, I think, to engage um, uh, private partnerships, to get private partnerships involved, and to make sure that we're making best advantage, taking opt making optimal use of the existing facilities um, so that, that we, we truly are integrating them. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I think we make a, need to make a commitment into um, our academic research fleet. That's, uh, we really do need to improve our research vessels that are going to be able to go out and uh, service ocean observatories, uh, take other additional measurements, and be able to integrate what we're finding from what we're learning from our satellite observations with what we're learning in situ in the ocean. Thank you very much, Doctor. And now um, I'd like to uh, recognize our ranking member here, uh, uh, Mr. B Whitman from the state of Virginia. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Pompani, I just wanted to um, point out I appreciate your, your advocacy of the ecosystem approach in marine management. I think that sort of holistic approach is extraordinarily valuable. Um, it's been, though, it seems somewhat difficult in the U.S. because of things like the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal, Pr Mammal Protection Act that elevate protection of certain species at higher levels than others. And with that in mind, can you comment about uh, how you see uh, the U.S. approach to an ecosystem uh, paradigm or framework 
in managing our marine resources. How, how can we do that based on these existing acts that sort of create a tiered approach uh, to this ecosystems management? If I may, Jason? I, I think the key to that is going to be to get the, the agencies that are, that are responsible for these, these regulatory policies to work together. I mean, we're dealing with a situation right now where we're trying to come up with a plan for environmental management prior to putting in some offshore uh, renewable energy uh, prototypes. And it really does involve working with a variety of agencies to make sure that we're taking care of, you know, we're addressing each of these regulatory policies. I think that's probably the, it might be a Pollyanna approach, but it's the simplest approach. And it's one actually that's working right now, I think. Yes, I, I think I'll just add very simply to that. I think that the ecosystem approach could provide you a tool to focus the efforts of multiple government agencies and non-governmental organisations on on a single uh, a single objective, if you like, for a sub-region. It also enables trade-offs to be made, and we've heard that this morning in the subcommittee. Uh, to first to identify what those trade-offs can be, and for decision makers and yourselves to understand uh, what is the consequence of those trade-offs, including with uh, protected species and make better informed decisions. So this may not necessarily require a substantially increased investment. It's just refocusing where the investment goes. Thank you. Mr. Nutter, um, you say that programs should focus on people and not insurance companies and that measures should be designed to protect the property, not support artificially low insurance rates. And can you tell me, uh, does this type of program exist today? And, and if so, where and can you tell us where it's been successful and maybe give us some examples of, of its application? Um, certainly. Let me start with where it exists today that's, uh, that's inappropriate, it would seem to us. The National Flood Insurance Program, which is a FEMA-run program, has uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of its insured policies are subsidized. In other words, they're not based upon true actuarial risk. Uh, it's an example of really encouraging and facilitating development in coastal areas. Uh, Insurance is regulated at the state level, so I think the answer to your question is that some states have done a good job in finding that balance between consumer protection of insurance rates and finding a risk-based rate. Uh, the state that has the most uh, difficult time with this is really Florida, largely because it's so exposed to extreme natural events, very heavily populated. Uh, mostly, they will say that 80 percent of the people who live in Florida are exposed to hurricanes, uh, and they have struggled with finding the balance between actually sound insurance rates that send a clear message about what the risk is and making certain that insurance is available to, uh, to people. Mr. Rothschild, uh, one last question. In, in your testimony, you referred to simplistic definitions and approaches that have been potentially ineffective in solving the problems that we face in our marine environments. Can you give some examples of what definitions and approaches you mean and maybe some, some effective ways with which to deal with, uh, with these concepts? Well, um, one simplistic approach is the concept that you can rebuild fishery stocks in, in a 10-year time period. And uh, empirical observations show that uh, sometimes fishery stocks take many more years than uh, 10 years or, or a shorter period of time. And uh, the approach uh, to dealing with this really relates to having a better understanding of the dynamics of ecosystems. And I propose that we have a national center to study uh, those components of ecosystems. It's very difficult to have an ecosystem approach to management in fisheries when the most sensitive aspect of uh, fish population dynamics is recruitment, and that's a problem. Uh, in other words, the number of young fish that are born each year, and that's a problem that uh, is unsolved. Dr. Rothschild, thank you. I think that's um, very insightful. I think sometimes there's a tendency to oversimplify issues that we all know are extraordinarily complex and all interrelated as to the ecosystem and other, other aspects of what we deal with. So I, I think that holistic approach and trying to go away from some of the more simplistic ways to say, well, it's as simple as A produces B is, is where we need to go. And I appreciate your insights there. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I thank the uh, ranking member, Mr. Whitman. And now I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Jackson, um, how does uh, IUCN envision the federal government fully implementing and enforcing existing laws such as the National Environmental Policy Act, the National Forest Management Act, and the Endangered Species Act? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I'll first say that I'm not an uh, expert on the US. My expertise is in international work. But I think uh, coming from that perspective, uh, there are many eyes on the, on the US, uh, and particularly on the excellent legislation that has been put in place over many years. And it's, uh, I think uh, I mentioned in my testimony about leadership of the US. And I, I think a key thing here is the, the implementation that was in my statement, uh, the implementation of that legislation, uh, if, if fully followed, will solve many of the environmental problems you've had, particularly on an ecosystem-based level. But more than that, it, it shows international leadership that these things can be done, they should be done, and they can be done economically by investing in prop good legislation and in good implementation of that. This morning, we heard also about the need for more integration across those various pieces of legislation, uh, across the various agencies. So I think uh, the comment in my statement was more up, keep up the good work and, uh, and take it forward rather than uh, shy away from the economic crisis and, and go backwards. Let me ask you this. Um, this is kind of a general problem we find in government. Um, we have good laws uh, like uh, NEPA and the National Forest Management Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, those are authorization bills. And authorization bills are somewhat like a, a get well card. You know, if I have a friend who is ill, I will send my friend a get well card which expresses my, how I value my friend, how I feel about my friend. What my friend really needs is the health care card. That's the appropriation. Is there a, a difference? Do you see a difference, of a, a significant difference between our sentiment expressed, and thank God they are, and I've supported all of these things, in the authorization bills and the actual uh, uh, health card bill, the, the appropriations to make sure these acts actually uh, carry out their purposes? Yes, uh, definitely a difference. I, I think if it's uh, if we don't follow up with uh, with investment in the legislation, in the ability of agencies to implement those things, then it does remain as a, a get well card. And to me, this is a, an issue of decision making. You, you, uh, if you understand the degree of dependency we have on natural systems, uh, the investment that you make in that. Uh, is that sufficient for what you get returned? Internationally, a recent study showed that we get somewhere around 33 trillion US dollars a year from ecosystem services, comparing that to gross national product globally of 16 trillion dollars a year. But, but if you look at the investment in economic issues versus environmental issues, I think we're fundamentally failing to understand where our dependency lies as uh, human beings. Thank you very much. I yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, Mr. Sablon. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and I'm very happy that um, you continue to give some attention to the issues that are very important to the area we represent. I come from the Northern Marian Islands, a part of Micronesia, and um, I am very pleased with the commitments that, or the attention that, that the oceans and, and climate change has been, are, are being given because frankly, whether it involves the, we're concerned about the polar bears in the Arctic or whether we're concerned about the inhabitants of an island in the Kiribati, um, climate change are indeed um, affecting these people are, uh, and these mammals or these species. Um, Dr. Pomponi, um, obviously, um, despite that sometimes um, governments give their departments, their patients, health care 
healthcare card. Sometimes patients compete for attentions of doctors. So your testimony highlighted the need for continued coordination among federal ocean agencies, that, and that problem was highlighted in the report of the Commission on Ocean Policy. But can you tell us, please tell us, how the lack of coordination has affected your own work through time? I think that uh, um, the, the fact that there are multiple, uh, you know what, I will give you one good example. I, can, I thought of actually just one example. One is that my own work involves marine natural products drug discovery. It's discovery of, of, of novel compounds from marine organisms that can be used to treat diseases like cancer. The National Science Foundation doesn't fund drug discovery and the National Institutes of Health doesn't fund kind of ocean-related work. So it, 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 that type of research often falls between the cracks. So that's one example that I can give you from my own personal experience. And so, for example, when you go to the National Science, it, and, and there has been an approach to address that, and that is the establishment of these ocean and uh, the Centers for Oceans and Human Health that have been joint ventures between the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. There are just a few of those, and the funding for those programs has, has dwindled. It's, it's been drastically reduced. But that's, been a, that's an example of where going to a single agency is not, is not effective, but if efforts have been made to, to collaborate among two or more agencies to provide the necessary resources to address ocean and human health issues. Thank you, Doctor. Um, now we really need that health card. <laughs> um, Dr. Jackson, um, in, in your submitted, your written testimony, you have several that the ocean drives weather patterns um, and, and so many other things. And, but I agree with you that marine ecosystems often extend across political or jurisdictional boundaries. And um, so my question is, um, implementing existing law and accurate valuations for, for um, understanding that this subcommittee on insular and oceans and wildlife had oversight responsibility for certain agencies under NOAA or the Department of Interior, what would be the focus of policy reforms to increase the commercial rewards for conserving biodiversity and increase penalties for biodiversity loss. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, in, in fact, I, d I don't think I can talk about national legislation to that extent, so I'm sorry. All right, so my other question, how do you envision regional ocean management agreements governing the range of activities and processes currently affecting marine ecosystems? Uh, yeah, L I think you, you mentioned before that the, uh, many of these marine e ecosystems cross political jurisdictions, uh, not, not just nationally, of course, internationally. And an area of substantial weakness at the moment in international law is it relates to the high seas, to particularly to the UN law of the seas. Uh, I think uh, that you could show uh, considerable leadership here in engaging uh, in, in these issues, at, at least from a, the agency's perspective with research into understanding the, the opportunities and constraints of improving that. We talked before about the ecosystem approach, applying that to uh, the international high seas. Uh, it's it's uh, something that's not impossible for several governments to come together, perhaps also with the private sector, the fishing industry, uh, with the conservation community to look at uh, how can this be done in an effective manner uh, to, to yield longer term benefits both uh, in terms in biodiversity but also in terms of economics of making those fisheries more sustainable. Uh, this is particularly important for island communities that are heavily dependent on those fisheries. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman from the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, Mr. Sablan. I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have maybe a few questions, but I'd just like to point out that this afternoon at Salt River in the Virgin Islands is a meeting on the um, 
Joint Institute for Caribbean Marine Studies and Marine Research and Education Center that uh, the University of the Virgin Islands is collaborating with several other universities, and we've been working on it for years. So hopefully we'll be able to contribute um, to the kinds of research that we're discussing today and do it in the right way, and do it in the right way. It started out as a reef research center, so the fact that it's gone from reef to marine, I think we're heading in the right dire direction. <laughs> we're not just focusing on one, um, one entity in the ocean. Um, well, Mr. Nutter, we live on, an, I, I represent the U.S. Virgin Islands. We can't move from our coastal areas or get out of the way of the hurricanes. Um, and over the, I've been here 12 years, and we've not been able to really pass any good legislation um, to uh, provide for um, disaster insurance and windstorm insurance. I believe early on there was one HR2, it, it might have been, um, that was around for several years where states were required to put together an entity to provide reinsurance. Uh, you're, you seem to not want the federal government to do it, but do you have any, any opinions about that approach, or is there some kind of regional approach where risk could be spread? We'd looked at that, but it seems like no matter where you are, you're subject to some kind of, of a disaster. So. Um, if you can understand what I'm asking. I, I, no, I think I do, and, and I appreciate the frustration of, of dealing with a, a very high-risk area that uh, has hurricane exposure, uh, has lived through uh, many difficult uh, time periods. And, and is experiencing some of the effects of climate change. A a absolutely. Uh, certainly the, the companies that we represent, the reinsurance companies, do in fact provide a risk-spreading mechanism for insurers that provide insurance to homeowners in a variety of areas. I'm not as familiar with the Virgin Islands, perhaps, as I should be to answer your question, but it seems no question that, that a, a solution clearly is hazard mitigation to see that the federal government does provide sufficient funding for the Virgin Islands and states uh, to give people credit for against their taxes, for instance, for providing mitigation against natural hazards, shutters, improved roofs, those kinds of things, so that people survive these natural disasters. Uh, and those kinds of efforts would seem to me to go a long way toward moderating the cost of insurance and the availability insurance in particularly high-risk areas like that. Well, we have done some of those things. We haven't gotten tax credits for them. <laughs> and um, our insurance costs didn't go down commensurate to the fact that we, we did a, apply new building codes, new roofing uh, standards, and so forth. But thank you for your answer. Um, Dr. Pomponi, um, I listened and I went through your testimony last night on ecosystem-based management, and it uh, obviously it brings together all of the ecosystems in managing the marine resources and as I understand it, it also coordinates activities uh, between those entities that impact adversely or positively on the marine environment. But in my district, and I suspect others, it's the fishing community that bears the brunt of any um, restrictions or uh, attempts to address for uh, any um, pro the reduced fish resources or marine resources or Im adversely impacted marine resources. Um, so in your experience, how, how have we been able to address non-point source pollution and development and, and their impact on, on our marine resources? Because we haven't been able to do it successfully. And, and, and in my experience, we're not we're not doing this successfully in many other areas as well, so it's not only the Virgin Islands. And by the way, the reason I'm a marine scientist today is because of an experience I had in the Virgin Islands when I was in college, so oh, that's great. what led to me going into this field. Great. I think that, um, in general, any, any group that's, that's targeted, uh, let me give you an example. In the state of Florida, um, 
non-point source pollution that's attributed to nutrients coming in from septic tanks has been a very great cause of concern. And so what's, you know, what's happened in our state is that there's legislation that's been passed that's going to, to reduce that both point and non-point source pollution from nutrients, uh, sewage going into the, to, uh, to our, our coastal environments. But it, it, it's a balancing act for, for each of these. I know that the, the fisheries are often targeted, and I think that when we start looking at um, um, establishment of these marine protected areas or habitat areas of particular concerns, we have to be really careful in terms of saying, okay, which areas are ones where fishing, fishing can occur, or which areas are ones where bottom trawling should definitely not ever occur. So it, it just requires more detailed information um, about the environment itself, about the actual impacts of the environment, and being able to show that there's a, a true cause and effect relationship. Does that sort of answer your question? I think it, it, it begins to get to it. I think, you know, sometimes it's just uh, pol politics that gets in the way. Um, the, the, and the, the public, need, yeah, and the, the need, political will. <laughs> yes, and the need for development, and um, I listen to Nature Conservancy, you know, talk about trying to bring some balance, but sometimes in a small community, that balance is very difficult to achieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any other questions. I thank the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, and I just have a couple of wrap-up questions here. Um, first for Mr. Nutter. In a recent Chartered Insurance Institute report, the CEO writes, and I quote, in reality, climate change is here now, and it is as much opportunity as risk for those who are wise enough to adapt early on, unquote. So how can the government help the insurance and reinsurance industries adapt and create opportunities in these times? And how can the government provide better climate change information so the reinsurance industry can reduce or mitigate for risk? At what scales is this information needed? It's a very good question, and I think the scale is really the answer to your overall question. Uh, climate science that is being pursued by the National Science Foundation, uh, University Center for Atmospheric Research, and other cli climate researchers really need to localize as much of the climate information as possible in order to do financial planning for the insurance industry or local planning for local governments uh, in dealing with infrastructure, bridges, levees, roads, that sort of thing that localized climate information would make a huge difference in helping everyone assess the risk, both the storm surge to increase in intensity or severity of storms, uh, as well as uh, increased precipitation. So I think the answer to your question is that if we could set a priority that we need to have localized impacts of climate change as best we can get it, that would make a large difference in how we assess the risk and how we manage the risk. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, all, Mr. Nutter, uh, in your opinion, if we do a better job of recognizing and mitigating the risk of natural hazards in the coastal zone, can we expect to see more and better opportunities for fish and wildlife conservation as a uh, uh, collateral benefit? It's a question for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Certainly, uh, the, the coalition that we are working with that involves a number of environmental groups, the Consumer Federation of America, a number of taxpayer groups, is really seeking to find that balance between proper land use management that preserves uh, coastal ecosystems that can be used as buffers for extreme weather events, uh, as well as to allow the development that Mrs. Christensen was talking about to find that balance. So a absolutely, trying to find that uh, coordination between preserving coastal areas that provide habitat as well as uh, provide protection for people would be the best long-term solution to providing local land use planning and financial management. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rothschild, did you want to comment on that? I, I didn't have anything to add. I was just learning You just myself. agree, right? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have one that, um, well, this is, takes me home. Dr. Jackson. I'm particularly interested in the section of your testimony that discusses mitigation banking in the context of wetlands. So I would appreciate your thoughts on how mitigation banking might be utilized in Guam. Could the principles underlying the development of wetland mitigation banks be employed to mitigate any adverse ecological impacts of the current military buildup? Okay. Um, 
Yes, I think the simple answer is yes. I think it, they could be. It's there. They've been uh, the early development of them, uh, which was pioneered here in the United States, has been uh, very promising. I think you have to keep in mind they are a, a tool, a tool that needs to be used with other regulatory mechanisms, uh, not not just to to be uh, based on financial mechanisms, but they are a very promising tool that. Uh, the user pay system, I think, is the, the basic principle behind it and the precautionary principle behind that again. So I, I think for Guam, yes, they could be. You know that uh, you have all sorts of environmental challenges, uh, invasive species being a particular one, and we also know how that was introduced, those, some of those species introduced into Guam via the military, and I think uh, that, that that principle of wetland banking or biodiversity banking could certainly be applied uh, more generally, uh, which would help with uh, mitigation efforts, but also help with a broader understanding of uh, if you have to make a change, then who, who's responsible and who should pay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Do you have any questions uh, to our ranking member, Mr. Kildee? Uh, I want to thank the witnesses on the second panel for their participation in the hearing today. It was certainly very informative. And members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 10 days for these responses. And if there is no further business before the subcommittee, the chairwoman again thanks the members of the subcommittee and our witnesses for their participation here this morning. And the subcommittee stands adjourned.